morning um, I'm going to be talking about overcoming the Chaldean spirit. And uh, I just want you to bear with me on this. And um, because what we are about to go into this morning is going to be deep. Um, if you have to write things down, I encourage you to write things down and chew on them later if you need to. If you need to come back to me later and ask questions, please do so. But I believe that what we have this morning is a word uh, directly from God. I don't know how else to say it. Um, this is a word that God has been putting in my spirit for about five or six days. I have been chewing on this over and over and over again and cannot get away from it. Um, and as I posted on Facebook how the Lord is dealing with me about this song or this uh, passage of scripture, next thing I know, people are inboxing me and, and calling me and talking to me and different things and saying, hey, God's dealing with me with that same exact passage. And I'm not talking about people from King Hill, I'm talking about from people all over the United States. Um, and uh, it's just amazing how God works like that. And so it, it's. Uh, it's, it's going to be a good word this morning, and I'm praying that you grasp this, because there are some people in here this morning that needs to be set free. Mm -hmm. um, you're saying, what, am I walking in bondage? If you're not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and the promises of God, yes, you're in bondage. That's right. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you're not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessings of God, you are in bondage somewhere, mm -hmm. and you need freedom. Um, you say, well, I'm a Christian. How can I be in bondage? Oh well, boy, I can go all day just on that subject there itself. But you can be a Christian and be in bondage to sin. You can be in bondage to self. You can be in bondage to addictions. You can be in bondage to all kinds of things. But I want to talk this morning about overcoming the child being in spirit. And you can go to Isaiah chapter 43. That's where we're going to camp most of our time today. Growing up, maybe you haven't, maybe you haven't heard these words, I don't know. But some of us deal with words that go through our heads every day, every time we wake up in the morning, maybe we go to bed at night, lay our head on bed at night, or maybe when we stand in line and we go to apply for a job or whatever. And some of these things that we hear over and over in our head is like a repetitive sound, such as you are ugly, you're stupid, worthless, inferior. You're disqualified, unworthy, weak, faithless, and hopeless. You're not spiritual enough. You don't pray enough. You're not strong enough. You're not wealthy enough, righteous enough, holy enough. You're not smart enough. You do not have enough faith, spiritual heritage. You don't have the right gifting or education to ever be used for God in the ministry. You are insecure, shy, rejected, and unaccepted. How many of us have ever had some of these words go through our mind? And let's be honest this morning. Many of us probably have. Maybe, maybe some of us don't want to be so honest and, and admit that we have. But we may have had some of these words just bombarding our minds as we get up in the morning or, or maybe throughout the day. Maybe we go to make a decision. We feel insecure. We feel like we're not worth measuring up. We're not worthy enough. See, these are destructive words caging people behind the bars of fear and intimidation. Because this is exactly where these words come from. So many people live in this constant bond, bondage of destructive lies, robbing every ounce of faith they even try to muster up. Words like acceptance, faith, love, righteousness, hope, whenever they're mentioned from the pulpit or in a song, anytime they're mentioned in a, in a teaching or a message, anywhere you hear these words, they're like a screeching of fingernails going down a chalkboard and just drives you insane and makes you shiver because inside you know this is truth, you know this is what you want, but you have these negative words that are holding you in hostage in your mind from pursuing that freedom. Unaccepted, unworthy, uneducated, not prayerful enough, not educated enough, don't measure up such powerful negative words. Within our soul, the constant gale for peace reminds us the depths of our pain. It reminds us of the fear that is holding us back. We hear words like freedom, but when we hear the word freedom, we feel paralyzed within, not because we don't want freedom, but because we fear the pain that's standing right before us. 
See, for decades I was imprisoned behind these bars. For decades I believed in these destructive words. And I kept believing them as though they were truth. My own self, my own personal self. The words in reality were the patterns of the enemy attempting to hold me back from being who God wanted me to be. Mm -hmm. The constant patterns over and over. The constant bullying and fear and insecurity and intimidation of others. See, regardless of the history of where these words come from, whether it's verbal abuse, whether it's insecurity, whether it's being out there, being bullied in, in, in you know, high school, growing up, or as an adult. You know, they talk about bullying in high school, but I tell you what, there's adults that get bullied as well. We may, we may be too proud to admit it, and as us as men may be proud, too proud to admit it, but there are bullying tactics that happen on jobs. It happens. You're saying, boy, you're getting up in my grill this morning. I hope I'm getting up in your grill this morning because God wants to set you free. Amen. I'm talking real life. I'm talking about real things this morning. I'm talking about something that we struggle with inside, but we don't want to talk about in the church. We don't want to talk about it in our circles. We want to hide behind pride. You're saying pride. Yes, pride is what keeps you from saying, I need help. That's right. Pride is what keeps you from saying, I need, I need deliverance. Pride is what keeps you from coming to the altar when you know inside you need freedom. Mm. Pride. It can be spiritual pride, it can be self-pride, it can be all kinds of different things, but it's pride. See, you would look at these patterns, and you would think that these patterns, you know, these, this thinking that I had in my mind would have shifted the moment I got saved. But in reality, you know, and, 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 and I struggled with it my whole life and asked God over and over again, is God, why did you take me out of drugs? Why did you take me out of alcohol? Why did you deliver me from all of this other junk? But deep inside, I had this deep-rooted pain of rejection and hurt and, 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 and condemnation and all this stuff that was deep inside. Why did it take five years? Why did it take six years to get me to the place where I started believing what you said about me instead of what others said about me? Mm. Why did it take this long? See, just because you get saved don't mean it all goes away. Just because you get saved and you start living for God don't mean you wake up and like out some coma in the last three or four days you don't remember it. You will remember. You will have things that you will struggle with. But the powerful thing is, is that God can deliver. God can heal. God can set you free. The question, though, is how bad do you want it? Are you willing to walk through the pain? Are you willing to walk through those dark areas of your life and let them go? Are you willing to overcome your pride enough to say, I need help. I need prayer. I need deliverance. See, it wasn't until five years later that God began to show me these things. And one of the lessons, the valuable lesson that he showed me was this, is that we must deal with the facts of pain. So we can move forward in the victories of truth God has called us to. I'm going to say, I'm going to say that again. We must deal with the facts of pain. So we can move forward in the victories of truth God has called us to. If we don't deal with our pain, we'll never get to the place God wants us in our life. We have to deal with that pain. You're saying, boy, that's just, you're asking too much. Well, let me ask you this. Do you really want the blessings of God? Do you really want to move forward in your relationship with God? Do you really want to overcome? Do you really want to make a difference? Do you really want to be used the manner He desires you to be used? He wants to set you free. He wants to bring healing in your life. But you've got to deal with the pain. See, sometimes the deep-seated issues take time to heal. Jesus said it this way. He says, if. I love how Jesus says if, because that means there's a, con there's a continuous thing here. There's, there's something that's saying, okay, if you do this, you know, it, it's kind of like on a hinge here, like a revolving door. If you go through the door, it says, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. In the Greek, it's talking about a process. See, the more that we know Jesus, the more that we're in the Word, the more we become free. See, over time, these destructive patterns create 
roadmaps in our mind, and, and of course there's all kinds of psychological terms we can use for this, but I'm not going to go into all that. But the thing is, is that these instructive patterns, these thoughts, and these, these things that go through our mind, they create roadmaps in our mind. And after a while, if we do not begin to deal with them, they'll start sabotaging everything like a ruthless, despicable, impetuous enemy that's trying to attempt and rob us of everything in life. Everything. And we have to, we have to deal with these. After a while, we begin to believe some of this nonsense. We begin to act it out like it's some self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, an open door over here, God opens for us, and we don't walk through that door. Why? Because we don't feel like we're worthy enough. Who are you to say you're not worthy enough when God is the one that opened the door? That's right. Do you hear what I'm saying? But the thing is that we're so trapped in our minds, we miss the doors and the opportunities God has for us simply because we believe the lies the enemy has held us bondage and trapped in for so long. God wants to set you free. God wants you to get past that. He wants you to get beyond that so that you can live the freedom He's called you, so, called you to. Long, before long, we begin to notice the constant cycle of destruction, destructive patterns as we live one bad experience after another bad experience. And we begin to, you know, we want, we want freedom, we want hope, but it's like this glimmer of light way down at the end of this tunnel that we can never reach. It's a cycle over and over. I mean, how many, how many people have you known or have you heard of? It's like they're constantly in this bad cycle over and over and over again. It's like it just doesn't work out for them. What well, doesn't work out for them because they are in this destructive pattern. They're in this pattern right here that I'm talking about. Eventually, we find ourselves at a place declaring such unbiblical statements. Think of this for a second. Such unbiblical statements like, God knows what He's doing. Yeah, God knows what He's doing. But He also knows where you're at and knows you need freedom. Mm -hmm. God didn't put you there. Don't, don't, don't blame your problems on God. And I'm going to back up a second and quit blaming it on the devil. We give the devil way too much credit for the messes we make ourselves. You hear what I'm saying? I told you this deep this morning. <laughs> we cannot blame the devil. We cannot blame God. Sometimes we just have to grow up and take responsibility for our lives and say, you know what? That didn't work out because I made the wrong choice. But now we can make the right choice by saying, hey, you know what? I may have made the wrong choice. That fact, yes. But the truth is, even though I may have made the wrong choice, he can set me free and put me in a path of freedom where he wants me to be. Hallelujah. So we take responsibility and give it over to God and let him see what, he's, what he can do with it. But we make such unbiblical statements like God knows what he's doing. It's just the way it is. I mean, how many of you have ever heard that? I've said it myself. Boy, did God deal with me on this one. I told you, God has had me locked in this cage for like, yeah, he's put me in a cage to think a little bit about all this for the last five days. He's really dealt me with, with me about that. It's just the way it is. No, it's not just the way it is. Let God get a hold of that. He changes things. It's not just the way it is. Too late to change things now. Really? <laughs> That's the most backwards words you could ever say. To someone that's believing for revival, because if you're believing for revival, you're believing for change. That's right. If you're not believing for change, you're not believing for revival. And if people that stink and people that look funny and people that's got tattoos and long hair and earrings and cuss and smoke and do all kinds of issues and come to church and don't know how to act in church and chew gum and everything else bothers you, then you're not praying for revival. Yeah. Because those are the people God wants to reach. Those are the people God wants to bring in. I'm not saying he can't bring in lawyers and all this. He can do that too. But you know what? I want all of it. I don't want just some of it. I don't want just my preferences. I want all of what God wants. Yes. I don't care who they look like. I don't care what they look like, what background they come from. If they are a human being and they can be saved by the power of God, they need to get here. Amen. Amen. That's who we want. That's what we want. This must be the my lot in life. Have you ever heard that? This must, must be my lot. You know, it's just what I have to deal with. Or even worse, this is just the way I am. Well, you know, if, this, if that is just the way you are, then you better get in the Word and let the power of God get a hold of you and change you. Because God did not make you to sin. He didn't cause you to be nasty. He called you to be holy and righteous. 
When we, when we search for the culprit behind all of these bars of bondage, we soon realize they can be summed up into one word, that's fear. Fear. You're saying being nasty is fear? Yeah, it is, because being nasty comes from insecurity. You know, you get around somebody that's real sarcastic all the time. You know where sarcasm comes from the majority of the time? Someone that's dealing with intimidation and insecurity. They're insecure inside. And because a lot of times, and I'm not talking about being joking, and I'm not talking about just having fun. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about someone, that, that even in the most serious of moments, they have to be sarcastic. There's this insecurity that's here. See, there's their fear of breaking this malicious cycle. You say fear, why? Because we're, we're fearful of uh, breaking this malicious cycle. Where we fear the past. We fear the future. And sometimes we even fear the present. See, fear is the prison we are captive behind. As we hear the bars yelling out to us one after another, the insecurities and the ugliness and the nastiness and the, the intimidations and everything else that are trying to yell out to us. See, despite the fact we know the scriptures declare for God has given us, has not given us a spirit of fear, but of, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And we know the scripture verse, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. See, even though we know those scripture verses, even though we have them here, we don't live them into here. And so we continue to hide behind the bars of lies as we're imprisoned in this bondage. See, the question is, how do I break this ball and chain? How do I escape this ruthless monster that's trying to hold me back from the things of God that he wants me to do? How do I find peace? Peace to sleep, peace to relax. Peace to just be myself and be happy around others. You know what I'm talking about. Just peace. Father, I ask right now, Lord, as we get into Isaiah 43 just for a few minutes. Lord, I know right now, just as I'm looking over people in here, I know this is a heavy message, but Lord, I can tell by the Holy Spirit, you're, you're dealing with hearts right now already. So, Father, I ask as we get into Isaiah that you open our spiritual eyes to see, our spiritual ears to hear. God, that you give us a heart of understanding so that we can apply and listen what it is you are saying to your church. Father, we'll never fail to give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Like the Israelites, if we don't take careful, if we're not careful, we can be come in prison to this demonic, thriving, ruthless, vicious, Chaldean spirit in our, in our minds as we become captives to the feelings and emotions of guilt, shame, and regret. Not just from our past, but maybe even things that's gone on in our present. You say, why are you saying Chaldean spirit? Why, what are you talking about here? Here's what I want to explain to you. The word Chaldean in Hebrew means wanderer. It means robber. It means to destroy. It means to be a demon. When you think of the word Babylonians, and we know that all throughout the Old Testament, many times we see the Israelites, they go in, and what happens is they sin against God, they rebel against God, and next thing you know, they're captive to who? Babylon. Well, within Babylon, there's a sect of people called the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans were well, very ruthless people. They were very vicious people. Matter of fact, they're so vicious and so vile that in the first chapter of Habakkuk, God explains his opinion about a people. Now, could you imagine being such a ruthless individual that God has an opinion about you? That's pretty ruthless. That's pretty low. See, the Chaldean word in Hebrew means wonder, robber, destroyer, demon. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, and it's really interesting, he said in John 10.10, 10, he said the thief comes to do what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. It's amazing to me that Jesus Christ talks about and identifies who and what the enemy does. And then when you look up the word Chaldean, their name is exactly the definition of what Jesus said the enemy comes to do. I hope you're listening to me this morning. I hope you're catching me. I hope you're catching this. The Lord describes the Chaldeans in Habakkuk 1, 6-11 as this, that ruthless and impetuous people. 
Could you imagine God saying something like that about us? That ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize, seize dwellings not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves as at dust. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping to devour. They all come intent on violence. Their, hard, their hardness advances like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities. By building earthen ramps, they capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty people whose own strength is their God. You're talking about a description of a sect of people. Man, I'll tell you what, I would never want God to say that about me. That is, wow. But these were people that were wicked. They were in sorcery. They were palm readers. They read astrology in the stars and tried to place their future off the star alignments and all these other things. They were a ruthless people. See, oftentimes when the Israelites willfully rebelled and sinned against God, they were captive to the Babylonians. But the Babylonians had this sect of people called the Chaldeans that were barbaric. They were so barbaric that they were known as being the most ruthless, vicious, and outright barbaric people in history during the time. They had no trouble killing men, women, or children and leaving a total wasteland behind. They had an enormous ability to intimidate, and here's something you've got to understand. They had an enormous ability to intimidate their enemies through various tactics of fear. Sometimes they would go to war and they would not even have to lift one bow or one sword or anything like that. All they had to do was play mind games with their enemy and they would win because of fear and intimidation. It's pretty powerful to think about it because what's the enemy try to do? He tries to create fear and intimidation in us. They have this enormous ability. Like the Israelites, some of us are held captive by the Chaldean spirit because of our willful disobedience to God through compromise or outright rebellion to the commands of Scripture. Paul refers to Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 1 and Acts 13 when he warns the crowd, and this is what he tells the crowd. He says, take care what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Take care it doesn't happen to you. What is, what is Paul warning there? Well, in, that, in the, verse, the verse previous to that verse, he's talking about Jesus Christ. He's talking about Jesus coming and dying for them and God done a new thing to His Son and now we have freedom through His Son. But he, what Paul is warning the people, he's saying, take heed. You better listen up because if you reject the Son of God, if you don't do what God is telling you to do by accepting the Son and selling out, Everything you are, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind to the Son of God. What the prophets talked about in the Old Testament will come upon you. Mm. He says you need to be warned about this. You need to take heed to this. Because we don't want that to happen. Paul, Paul was warning the Gentiles if they did not repent and turn to Christ. Basically, in a nutshell, they were opening themselves up to judgment. See, when we think of the judgment of God, we think of the judgment of God for only sinners. But the bottom line is, and the truth is, is that when we get into Scriptures, we know that throughout Scriptures, it's clear that God says that He disciplines those He loves. That He disciplines those He loves. Matter of fact, in Hebrews 10, 26-31, and the writer of Hebrews says this, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. But only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think, this is a really good question, how much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge whose people? Did he say the devil's people? Mm -mm. Who did he say? He says his people. His people. The Lord will judge his people 
And then the writer of Hebrews finishes the passage off. It says, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. See, sometimes we're, we're trapped in this because of our own willful disobedience and our own compromises in life. I, my kids were growing up, they get mad at me sometimes because I would not allow certain things in my home. They're like, Dad, I don't understand. Why can't we watch this? Or why can't we listen to this? Or why can't we do this? And I would tell them because I don't want any open doors of the enemy in my house. I don't want that cussing, drugging music in my house that talks about promoting sin and loving the devil because I don't want sin opened in my house. When it comes to sin in my house, the door is closed. That's right. I don't want going in here and watching Harry Potter and, and glorifying witchcraft and glorifying all these things that are demonic because in my house, witchcraft and things that glorify the devil and the dark side is closed. Because I don't want an open door in my house. And some of y'all say, well, I don't see nothing wrong with Harry Potter. Then I'm going to pray the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you really strong. <laughs> yeah. Because I don't know what Harry Potter you've been watching, but any of Harry Potter, even in the clip that I've seen, has a ton of witchcraft in it. You're saying, Pastor, boy, you, 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 you like harsh this morning. I'm not being harsh. I'm being real. I'm getting the truth to you. I'm getting you to a place where I, I believe God wants us to be. Because there's some of us, we have compromised and opened the doors of the enemy in our life. And then we're like, how did we ever get here? You got here because you made the choice to open the door to the enemy. You say, well, man, I'm always getting attacked by the devil. Well, you know, the devil's not omnipresent. He can't be all places all times. So I don't know if you know that. So what does that mean? Yeah, you can be attacked by the oppression. You can be attacked by all kinds of demons and all kinds of things in your life. But some of the things that we are entrapped with, some of the things that we walk through in life is because of our own choices. And what was the choice? The choice was is that we chose to bow to sin. We chose to open the door to compromise. Instead of saying, God, I want to close the door on that chapter. I want to close the door on this chapter. I want to close the door on that chapter, this chapter, whatever chapter it is, that door, that door that you need to close. To say, that is not in my house. That is not in my life. That is not in my family. Because it does not glorify the Son of God. What doors have you opened in your home? What doors have you opened in your home? Yet others remain enslaved to this destructive pattern because they have bowed their knee to the intimidation of the Chaldean spirit. It's not necessarily they've compromised. It's not necessarily they've rebelled against God. It's not because they necessarily sinned against God. But what they've done is they've bowed the knee to this Chaldean spirit, the spirit of intimidation, simply because they don't want to walk or they can't feel like they can walk because they believe the lies of the enemy. And so they don't rise up in the power of the Holy Spirit and live by faith. So what do they do? They hide and they bow to this. See, but the, here, here's the powerful thing. Here's the most important thing. Is that no matter how you got to where you're at, there's freedom. Mm. Mm. There's freedom. Hallelujah. No matter, no matter how you got there. You're saying, boy, you don't know the doors I've opened in my house. And boy, I look and I think about the doors I've opened in my house. And you don't know the fight I'm going to have if I go home and shut that door. I'm going to tell you right now, if you go home and shut that door, you're going to have a fight. Because you're going to have every, every demon in hell that's going to rise up against you. Maybe some people that's going to try to argue with you. But if you don't shut that door, you're going to continue in the mess that you're in. And there's going to be nobody's fault but your own. Because you didn't take a stand and say, not in my house. Not in my house. You're saying, well, I don't want to run people off. You know what? I pray all the time. I want to be just like Joseph. That when that woman comes to my house and she's knocking on my door, or if I, or she invites me up to her palace room and she takes that robe off, I don't care how beautiful it looks or how wonderful she smells, I'm going to run mm -hmm. from sin. Amen. I'm going to run from the door. I'm going to run from the compromise. I'm going to run from where the enemy is trying to entrap me. Amen. Yeah, it may cost me going to prison. Yeah, it may cost me being thrown in a hole. Yeah, it may cost me my family. It may cost me something. But I don't know anybody ever in this lifetime who has not sold out to Jesus Christ who it did not cost them something. Yeah. 
That's why Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to make a choice. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to sell out or are you going to compromise? Are you going to say, oh, well, that's okay. I don't want to offend anybody. That, you know, go into all this other stuff. Or are you going to stand up and say, no, uh-uh, not in my house, not in my family, not in my church. I will not accept sin. I will not tolerate sin. I will not tolerate the compromise and the, and the open doors of the enemy. I will not tolerate gossip. I will not tolerate rage and anger and, and all this other junk that goes on. I will, not, I will not tolerate dissension. Stand up. Stand up. The question is not whether freedom is accessible, but whether someone will repent and turn to the Lord and quit bowing the knee to this demonic spirit. Paul knew this very well. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5, he says this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. See, there's some Christians that think that because they're saved, they get to get saved and not sit down and do nothing. Paul warns us over and over again, to be a Christian, you're at war. You're being called into an army, the greatest army ever. Mm -hmm. And you're a soldier of that army. Are you hiding underneath a bushel from the enemy? Are you engaged with the rest of the army and fighting the battle? God's not called you to go hide under a bush, so he's called you to fight the battle. And Paul says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. But how many times we know Christians over and over and over again, they try to fight spiritual problems with fleshly ideas. Mm -hmm. And you can't fight spiritual problems with fleshly ideas. You have to fight spiritual problems in the spirit. You have to in the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We talked about strongholds earlier. But listen to this. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Notice what Paul says here. We are the ones responsible for taking that thought in our mind and making it subject to the Word of God. What does that mean? That means when you say when you think you're ugly, and I, I told somebody this the other day, I said, fact is, I ain't the greatest looking guy in the world. But the truth is, I ain't the ugliest either. Fact is, I may not have all the money in the world, but truth is, I ain't the poorest man in the world either. See where I'm going with that? Take those thoughts captive. The Lord told Israel to miss their pain four times in Isaiah chapters 43 and through 44 of Isaiah, and twice, just in the first five verses, and that's all we're going to look at as the first five, six verses, he told them four times, don't be afraid, don't fear. See, just in the first six verses, we, we, we learned some really, really important things, and I want you to catch this. First one is, is even in the midst of rebellion, bondage, and captivity, God still promises freedom. It don't matter how you got to where you're at. God still promises freedom. When, when, when God writes, and I'm going to read these promises in a minute, when God wrote and spoke to, when God spoke to the prophet Isaiah and he spoke to Israel and they wrote down what he was saying, Israel was still in bondage and still in rebellion to God when he spoke these promises. And to me, that's a powerful thing because I'm going to show you something here. In verses 22 and 24, it says, Yet you have not called on me. And this is what the fact of uh, Isaiah 22 through 24. Uh, uh, God says this in his word. says, Yet you have not called on me, Jacob. You have, not, you, you have not wearied yourselves for me, Israel. You have not brought me sheep for burnt offerings, nor honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with grain offerings, nor wearied you with demands for incense. You have not bought any fragrant calamus for me, I, or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifice. So he's saying, okay, God's telling Jacob, he's like, you've not done any of these things. You know that I require these things, but you've not done any of these things. But listen to this last verse in verse 24. God tells Jacob, he says, this is what you have done. You have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. I mean, think about that. Wow. To think that God told Jacob, 
Your sins and your offenses are so great. They weary me out. They wear me out. Have you ever had a child that just, it's like, you just have one of those days with that kid. It, you, you almost want to trade them in. <laughs> you know, they just wear you out. And this is kind of what God is saying to Jacob. He's saying, you have wore me out with your sins and your offenses. You, you have just wore me out. And he says this after he says the promises that we're going to get to in just a second. And, but when we get into Romans 5, 8, Romans 5, 8, I love this. Think about this. Because it's, it's, God illustrates it in the New Testament. He says, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, not when we got saved, not when we cleaned it up, not when we got it together, not when we thought we were good enough, nothing like that. He says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Think of that. All these people that are out here causing trouble, all these, you know, the, the, the what's that Mexican mob gang or whatever they, they say is running around here and all the mess that's going on and, you know, the shooting, just all the drugs, everything that's going on around him. They are sinners, but you know what? They are sinners, but Christ died for them even when they are sinners. So what does that tell me? That tells me that even though they're walking in their bondages and they're walking in their filth and they're walking in the trash of life and they're in the ditches of life and they don't know God and they're setting themselves up for the wrath of God, God still died for them to set them free. Amen. So what does that tell us? That tells us that if we are saved, we are to go out and tell people and proclaim to people the hope of salvation, the hope of that freedom. Notice that Jacob wore Israel out, or wore God out with his offenses. Israel just wore God out with his offenses and his sins. But when we go back up to verse 1, the first thing that he says is, do not fear. Do not fear. Verse 1 says this, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear. For I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. And the flames, they will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Sheba in your steed. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Think about this. God is telling Jacob, he's telling Israel, this is how I see you. This is who you are. This is what, this is what I want for your life. But then at the end of the chapter, he's saying, but your sins have wore me out. It wore me out. He says not to fear though. Why? Because you're created in His image. You're formed in His likeness. He's redeemed you. He's called you. He's with you. He has given you an inheritance. The Bible says He would make your enemies. You know, the, the, the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. That He will make your enemies even at peace with you, Proverbs talks about. The thing I love what he says here too, he says he honors you and he loves you because you're precious to him. All that junk you believe about yourself, all those words of negativity and trash, where does it come from? It comes from the pit of hell. It comes from the very pit of hell. Verses 5 and 6 God says it again to him. He says, do not be afraid. He says, do not be afraid for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. I say this all the time when I pray. Sometimes I'll be in a sanctuary and I'll pray and I'll stretch my hand to the north. I'll stretch my hand to the south. I'll stretch my hand to the east and to the west. And I'll say, God, give me the gate. God, give me the gate. God, give me the gate. God, give me the yes. gate. I want your yes. name glorified in my city. Yes. And sometimes I will, I'll stand, I'll stand in these altars and I'll pray. Or sometimes I'll even be at home. And I will literally say that out. Give them up! Yes. Devil, take your hands off of them. They're God's kids. They're 
for your employees. They were made for you, God. Mm -hmm. They were made for you and to give you glory. They weren't made for the works of the enemy. They weren't made for lives of trash. They weren't made for lives of destruction. They were made to give you glory and honor. Enemy, take your hands off, St. Joe. Enemy, take your hands off, my family. Enemy, take your hands off, my church. Because they are to be given up for the glory of God. Hallelujah. You're precious in His sight. You're precious. He's with you. He'll unite your family. He'll declare freedom over your life. He'll declare freedom over the captives. He's created you with the purpose. He's given you the purpose of giving Him glory. Fact is, yes, you are unworthy. Truth is, He sets you free through the power and blood of Jesus Christ to set you and make you worthy before the Lamb of God. Mm. Fact is, yes, you have a past and it was a mess. Truth is, that doesn't have to be your future because every man that is born again, every man that is saved, all that old stuff is gone and now you become new. New. You're saying, well, I'm not as smart as someone else. That might be a fact, but the truth is, you're not in some hospital somewhere either unconscious and can't think. Think about that. So me know where I'm at. I'm going to wrap this up and we're going to go home. I told you this was a little deep this morning. Paul gave us a practical way how to handle this malicious and destructive spirit. You're saying, why are you, well, you keep saying this is a spirit? Well, the thing is, is Paul refers to it as a spirit when he gets into uh, Acts 13. And the reason why I say that is because the Chaldeans were annihilated and completely destroyed and wiped off the earth around 585 B.C. before Christ. Yet Paul talks about it in the book of Acts not to be like the Chaldeans. Well, you can't be like the people that don't exist. So what is he talking about? He's talking about a spirit. Paul gave us a practical way to handle this malicious and very destructive spirit. Again, in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and, fall, uh, 3 and 5, Paul writes this. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So, but the question remains is how do we do this? How do we do this? How do we do this? First, we must first seek deliverance. We have to seek deliverance. We need to realize it is a spiritual battle and seek spiritual assistance in getting delivered. We cannot expect to fight spiritual battles with fleshly ideas and fleshly war and war tools with our mind and with our man's ideas. We have to fight spiritual battles in the spirit. If you're not, you'll be like the sons of Sceva in the book of Acts who went and they tried to rebuke the demons and they said, well, this Holy Spirit, this power that Paul has, I rebuke you. And you know what happened? The demons beat them up and sent them home naked, running down the streets. Why? Because they were trying to fight a spiritual battle in their own strength. And you cannot do this in your own strength. You've got to have the deliverance of God. Matter of fact, the word Christ, or that Christ comes from the idea of being delivered or the deliverer. See, Jesus Christ is your deliverer. You're saying, well, how do I get rid of this? Matthew 16, 18 and 19 says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. If you're a child of God, you have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. The door is not locked this morning. You've got the keys. Thank and whatever you bind on earth, you will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, whatever spirit you bind here is bound. Whatever spirit you loose here is, is, is loose. Thank you, Jesus. You've got to seek deliverance. Sometimes the biggest piece of deliverance we need is our pride. And saying, God, help me overcome my pride so that I can seek the help I need. Second, we must renew our minds. Once we get deliverance, we must continue in this process daily by renewing our minds, by filling it with truth. Romans 12 and 2, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. Then you will know and be able to test and prove what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Ephesians 4, 22 and 24, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off that old self. Get rid of it. It's not just who you are. If that's who you are, then that's your old self. You need to get rid of it. Which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. To be being new in the attitude of your minds. 
and to put on a new self created to be like God in righteousness and holiness. So you need to seek deliverance. You need to renew your mind. Third and last, we must live by faith. We have to. Remember there's a difference between fact and truth. We heard an awesome message a couple of weeks ago about that and I just continue to hammer on that because it's so true. Fact is you have had a painful past. Fact is you've been in bondage. Fact is you've experienced deep negative thoughts and emotions. Fact is you've got pain that is beyond understanding that is hard to let go. But the truth is the Lord sets people free and you can be free. Do you hear what I'm saying this morning? The fact is the process is painful. But the truth is the Lord says I will never leave you. The fact is, you're going to have sleepless nights as you walk through the process. But he says, I promise my beloved sleep. Today the question is not whether or not God wants to set us free. The question is not whether or not he's got freedom for us. The question is not, is are you willing and how bad do you want it? How bad do you really want it? We talk freedom. We read about it. We know the churchy lingo about it. But how bad do you really want freedom? Freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is. There's freedom. How free are you? Father, I ask right now that in the name of Jesus, your Holy Spirit, come. Lord, your word says that you've come to set us free. And to whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Your word tells us, Lord, where your spirit is, there is liberty, there is freedom. Father, your word all throughout declares freedom, 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 freedom. Freedom for the believer. Father, we don't have to live in bondage. We don't have to live in intimidation. We don't have to live in fear. We don't have to live in the past. My goodness, God, we don't even have to live in the present because you have us focused on the future. Father, I thank you this morning for freedom. And Lord, as we go into this next song, God, I ask that the first thing that we get freed from is pride. Amen. Pride that keeps us from asking for help. Pride that keeps us from asking for assistance. Pride that keeps us from wanting to seek deliverance. Pride that keeps us from pursuing further and deeper because we don't want to deal with the pain. Lord, I'm asking, Lord, I'll be the first. Second, Lord, I ask God, anybody that, that is in that pain, that is in that, that, that torture, that torment that they're going through and walking through in their life, Lord, I ask that right now where the enemy's trying to come and even intimidate them and say, this ain't for you. That, that, that it's coming and saying, well, you've prayed before. That where the enemy's trying to come and, and this lie all this junk to them, God, I ask right now that something rise up inside of them and, Lord, that they would sense the urgency as though they need to run to get freedom, that they got yes. us to be set free, yeah. and Lord, that they're willing to do whatever it is, they don't matter how, what it looks like, what it yeah. sounds like, they want you and they want freedom yeah. more than anything they've ever experienced before in their life. Father, just move upon every heart. Yes, Lord. Move. If you're here this morning, and I'm not going to ask you to come down front. I'm going to do something different this morning. If you're here this morning and you're saying, you know what, I got, to, I got, to, I got to have freedom. I need some freedom. What I want you to do is, I just want you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come down front. Just raise your hand and say, I have got to have some freedom. There's, there's some freedom. I want somebody to pray with me. I, I have, I got to have some freedom. Anybody in here? I've got to have some freedom. You're saying, well, you know, Holy Spirit, you see every heart, you see every life. Father, I'm believing right now that your Spirit is setting us free, that you bring liberty, God, and healing. 
healing God. Lord, help us not to be like the Chaldeans. Help us not to be like the Israelites. Bow our knee to the Chaldeans. Help us not to be a, a life of compromises. Help us to be a life that is pleasing to you. Lord, that we would choose today, today in this house, we would serve you and you only. here. I don't know if you sense it or not, but he's here. Sometimes the Lord shows up and it's like a heaviness. It's like a, like a holy question. Almost. And when he does that, he's, he's speaking the heart. encourage you to, to listen to what he's telling you, what he's saying. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we are precious in your sight. Thank you, Lord, that you've redeemed us. Thank you that you've known us in our mother's womb. Thank you, Lord, that we are a blessing, that we are a user, that we are a teacher. Thank you, Lord, that we are wise because your word says that you've given us wisdom. Thank you, Lord, for your word tells us that we don't have to hold on to the past, but we can let it go and move toward the future and we, as we move to the future we are renewed every single day in your power and your blessing thank you God for healing the word says that we can be healed not just in our bodies but even in our emotions and in our minds Lord thank you for that healing thank you Lord for peace that passes all understanding that no matter what we go through, you are the, our peace. You are our comfort and our strength. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to do something really, really odd that's probably not been done. That's okay. I know we're, we're right about 5 till 12. I'm not, I don't want to miss the Holy Spirit. I don't want to miss what God's doing. Is there anybody in here? I've, I've not told you this has never been done before. You're probably saying, well, what is he doing now? We believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We believe God speaks to His people. We believe God moves in those manners. I'm not talking about getting all flaked out. That's not what I'm talking about. I do believe he uses gifts. I believe he speaks to people's hearts. Is there anybody in here that just like the last 10 minutes God has spoken to you that you, you feel like you need to share? There's something that's pounding in your heart. You know this is the Holy Spirit and you feel like you've got to share this. Mm -hmm. You're saying, well, what are you doing? I'm teaching you how to listen to God and open up to the gifts of the Spirit as he's speaking to you and be using those gifts. I know beyond shout out there's gifts of the Holy Spirit in this congregation and He uses people mm -hmm. all the time. Is there anybody? Don't be shy about it. Mm -hmm. You say, well, I just don't know if this is God. The only way you're going to know is to step out. And if it's not, you're off. I'll let you know. No, I'm not going to rebuke you, embarrass you, and everything else. But I'll let you know. Mm -hmm. Anybody. God's, God's spoken to your heart. God said something. You feel like I've got to, I've got to share this. 
Father, I thank you this morning that you speak to us. I thank you, Father, that you use the gifts of the Holy Spirit to do that, to edify your body. Father, I, just, I know that you speak, spoke to hearts. I know you've made that clear. Thank you, Jesus, for confirming your word. Father, as we go on into this, this song as we're released for the day and throughout the week, help us to walk in that freedom. Mm. Help us to be strengthened in your word, strengthened in the power of your love. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask one more time before we go into the song. Any, anybody that's like, there's something inside. I, I just felt like I, I've got to give opportunity for that this morning. I'd rather give opportunity and someone disobey God because they did not do what God wanted them to do than for me to not give opportunity and completely miss it. Yeah. If that makes sense. Um, okay. Well, we're going to go, let's go into our, our closing song if you don't mind. Okay. And, um, and we're going to be released today. And then you'll have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful 4th of July. Amen. Amen.